Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Indian Energy World. This is the curtain raiser of our special virtual initiative, the Economic Times Energy Leadership Summit. This event has been conceptualized uh, with a very special vision uh, to develop a platform for the world leaders to come together and share views on some of the key trends and the most pressing issues in the larger energy domain. From the perspective of topics, its uh, agenda is uh, heavily tilted in favor of the unfolding uh, energy transition agenda globally and in India. And that, of course, covers uh, renewable energy, green financing, oil and gas, electricity, and e-mobility, uh, apart from energy storage and battery technology, digital transformation, and clean coal technologies. Over a period of two days, uh, that is 17th and 18th of June, uh, we will witness more than 40 leaders uh, and experts from the public and the private sectors uh, chart a roadmap uh, for the new world order in energy as it is seen emerging on the backdrop of the economic recovery from the pandemic. I would now invite uh, some of these leaders to uh, share their thoughts on the agenda of the event and why they think it is important to talk about these subjects in their own experiences, share their understanding of leadership, and also share some thoughts on the key developments in their own industries. Thank you. Well, India has about uh, 380 gigawatt of uh, generation capacity currently installed, including uh, 93 gigawatt of RE capacities. And by 2030, we expect RE to reach to about 450 gigawatt. So a strong interconnected grid to carry reliable and quality power would be crucial to deal with the intermittency of RE generation. Hence, uh, the transmission sector needs to not only drive the energy transition, but also facilitate the twin objectives of 24 by 7 energy access and affordability. In the next few years, the power sector will have to move towards flexible transmission planning, freedom of design to promote innovation, green field projects together with capacity augmentation of existing transmission infrastructure, and also uh, energy storage solutions. Also, I would say that networks would have to be planned not only for N minus one, but also for N minus two contingencies for a truly robust transmission grid. Planners should have an objective evaluation of transmission plans around key dimensions of time, space, and capital. Uh, so one of the biggest challenges for RE integration is that huge generation capacities are being added much faster than evacuation systems can be built. And uh, the goal is to build transmission lines that consume the least right of way commissioned in matching timeframes of RE projects and with the availability of efficient capital resulting in the least cost of supply. Solutions are available to build lines with higher line capacities at higher voltages using ROW, lesser ROW, and for enabling faster execution of projects, for example, using aviation technologies and construction. Through a conducive policy and regulatory framework, which is open to new technology adoption, it is possible to accelerate the adoption of these solutions and get better results. So it is the responsibility of all stakeholders to not only plan well, but also to make sure that projects get commissioned as per plan on time. Retrofitting existing transmission infrastructure around uprate and upgrade, augmenting capacities is a environmentally friendly solution, which can be done uh, parallelly and which uh, can be done at lesser time and in a cost effective manner India achieving 100% electrification target is a huge positive. However, we still lag far behind in per capita consumption with respect to global average and are even far behind developed economies. To achieve this growth, we have to make sure that sustainable and environmentally friendly electricity generation is sufficient. Transmission and sub-transmission network should be robust and sufficient for all variation and contingencies. Importantly, the distribution network, which is the last mile, must be capable and efficient enough to provide 24 by seven reliable 
and affordable electricity to every citizen of the country while a lot is being done for the generation and ehv transmission infrastructure it is the sub transmission and distribution network which remains sub optimal plagued by high distribution losses contingency planning and higher frequency of element outages need to be resolved sustainably hence i would say sudhir both bottom up and top down planning needs to be carried out in a coordinated manner to ensure that network is optimized with respect to load and generation growth so uh, this framework of uh, one sun one world one grid this will i think enable a platform for global cooperation on this grand vision our country will have to strengthen its ties with uh, like minded international partners and evolve a global consensus to achieve its goals and once the consensus is evolved there will have to be standardization of cross border regulatory and interconnecting standards and there will be need to have a clear road map and long term agreements with member countries to ensure implementation in terms of preparation uh, the domestic industry needs to prepare itself to cater to need uh, for technological interventions such as high power high depth submarine cables energy storage real time artificial intelligence based uh, smart grid infrastructure to manage the overarching grid infrastructure for this there is an urgent need i think to build capacities and capabilities in the country we need to be leader in developing solutions both technological and regulatory to address the challenges of large cross border power exchange i think government has played a pivotal role in spurring private investment in the uh, sector uh, de bottlenecking de bottlenecking of critical challenges creating funds aimed at the development of power sector the tbcb framework which is tariff based competitive bidding and its strong payment uh, security mechanism has opened the development of transmission projects to the private sector clear guidelines uh, i believe concerning row uh, were issued by ministry of power i think in 2015 energy access make in india industrial growth and ev penetration will boost electricity demand requiring a sizable installed capacity of generation funds like psdf which have enabled the development of power systems in the country and government's plan to set up ultra mega re parks in ladakh and kutch regions and offshore wind energy in the coastal regions uh, would be the right steps in that direction i think and additionally several actions can help in revitalizing the power sector like long term perspective planning for transmission with the right economic incentives for re developers to locate their projects such that it ensures optimal utilization of transmission assets ssa state support agreement is necessity for us in transmission sector for on time commissioning of uh, these uh, infrastructure projects and transmission and i believe investments in the infrastructure sector in general and power transmission sector in particular need to be promoted through uh, enabling regulatory framework that ensures a level playing field between public and private sector both the growth for the transmission sector would come from developing re evacuation infrastructure and strengthening state grids uh, the past 18 months we have seen uh, transmission projects with a value of about 25000 crores coming for competitive bidding private developers have entered the market with the auctions witnessing widespread participation and intense competition our country is bestowed with re potential in specific regions of the country the hot deserts of rajasthan and cold deserts of ladakh have high solar irradiance and the southern states have high wind speeds this potential must be tapped at least uh, at the least cost and renewable energy transmitted to the load centers of india to achieve its 
net zero carbon rate by 2050, uh, which is an announcement for which uh, there is a uh, discussion going on at uh, government of India level to adopt. Also developing inter and intra-state transmission projects and energy storage systems will draw the interest of global investors. Going forward, the key priority would be to make the power sector resilient, both physically and I believe financially by bringing in much needed reforms in uh, electricity tariffs. The way I see it, uh, leadership is usually tested during times of a crisis. And this COVID-19 pandemic you see is arguably one of the worst, uh, the worst disruptions of the 21st century. It has also flummoxed leadership in both the business and political world. Leaders will have to challenge their assumptions and be guided by their experience, empathy, emotional intelligence, energy, vision, and intuition. Secondly, uh, conviction, collaboration, and communication will assume more significance than ever before within the C-suit. Leaders will have to work tightly as a cohesive unit in order to drive operational transformation and strategic execution. And importantly, in the context of events like climate change and the fallout of the pandemic, it is very important to consider the impact that businesses going forward will have on society and environment. All businesses need to have a larger vision now, which will be around environment, sustainability and governance, which is ESG and build sustainable business models. Hello, hi, and I'm very happy to be here and speak with you and thank you for the opportunity. The biggest challenge of energy leaders today is to build around digital transformation is how to build their technology roadmap and, and the right blend using different tools. As we know, at the end of the day, the goal of any uh, energy company and utility company is to build a safe network and to grow the business in a safe manner and an efficient manner. And, and in, in order to do so, definitely technology can help. And more specifically, the use of digital tools can be play a significant role in this journey, in this effort. Now, uh, energy companies are some, you know, they can be, be in operation for decades. And there are a lot of things that can be improved, a lot of new technologies that are being presented to the industry. And the question is, at the end of the day is, as a leader, is look at all the technologies that are available on the one hand. And some of them are well proven, some of them are maybe more like uh, long term initiatives. So do you have this on the one hand. And on the other hand, you're looking at the company and all the processes that are in place, a lot of legacy tools and stuff like this, and how to blend between the two, how to come up with a roadmap that will help me to see uh, a short-term return on the investment in terms of the, of the efficiency, safety, increasing the safety of the network, and so on and so forth, but also looking a little bit long-term in more, I would say, strategic uh, uh, initiatives. So I think it's very clear that the energy sector is heading to a more distributed network on the one hand, and a different mix of resources that are going to play in this, uh, in this blend. And at the end of the day, if you look at a network uh, of any energy company, or, or if we look at, at the households at the end of the day, they are going to get energy from different resources. Uh, and it's going to be, might, well, and it, maybe it will be a two-way process. It will be uh, also generating uh, energy and also buying and selling for the network. And, and at the end of the day is how can I make sure that I have the, the tools and the data to support this type of uh, mix and this type of distributed model. As we know, there are a lot of investments that are now happening specifically in India around gas, not only in India, but in India around gas infrastructure, both on the distribution, the CGD business, as well as the transportation high pressure, pressure pipeline project. And at the end of the day, the goal of all the players in the industry is to make sure that they are building a safe network on time and on budget. This is the goal. All of them are spending or will be spending a lot of billions and billions of, of dollars in building the network in the next decade. And, and a lot of the network is going to be built by third parties, contractors that are going to build on the behalf of the CGD 
on the behalf of all the, of the transportation company. But how can we make sure that the field crews that are building the network on the behalf of the energy company will do it in a, in a safe manner and will provide us with all the data that we need first to make sure that the infrastructure is safe, that we have all the data about the assets that were installed in order to support the future needs. And also, of course, looking in terms of financial resources, reconciliation of the asset and general uh, project management tool. And I think that in this case, uh, technology can play a, a great role. And I can tell you that more specifically, this is what our company does. What we did over the past uh, five to six years, we built a technology that really focused around gas and energy in general, infrastructure construction, and building a platform to close this gap and to enable some of the largest utilities in the US to manage the entire construction project end to end from the design, the initiation of the project. That when you know what you wanna build, you have the budget, you have the design through the actual ex execution in the field, the as field, the as made that is being done during construction and the project closes out at the end of the day. I think as you know, we are Israeli American technology company. We are on the Israeli side, we came with the technology and the R and D, and then we had a strong US space that are with export that have come from the energy and more specifically the gas industry in the US. And together we really try to come up with a solution that will help some of the largest US utilities to manage their construction and capital project, as I mentioned, and really take the work with them as our design partners in this journey of digital transformation. Now, when you're talking about com with companies that already have millions of miles of assets that are already buried in the underground, they have really, they don't have enough data. This is why you, they are doing a lot of, they have a lot of initiatives that their goal is to increase data integrity and also, also of course, replacements and, and, and repairs of the network. I think that in this, uh, in, in, in the, if you look at India today, they have the privilege to build their network almost from scratch, but also to start from day one you, and to use the tools that are today are available and you can put it in the hand of the field crews in order to make sure that the job is done today on time, as I said, on budget in a safe manner and to make sure that they have all the data that they need to, for the next decade or two decades uh, moving forward. Uh, thanks, Yair. Uh, thanks for those uh, comments. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I remember when we, we were talking about uh, this entire issue last time also, a few months back. And uh, that time also you were saying that how uh, critical time is, right? Uh, because we have, as a country, we have to make the decision to choose the right things for us in that in this phase of expansion now, right? Because if we, if we don't do it now, to, tomorrow when the, that development has happened and projects have come up, Right, we won't have the time to go back and correct things. Right, uh, so so time is now to make the decision. That's exactly. a, that that was my key takeaway from from that time. And and, and and I can tell you, and I can tell you that during COVID, despite all the really uh, um, and the situation that is not easy for everyone worldwide, and specifically in India these days, I can tell you that during COVID, we deployed our technology and support pretty large projects in India during COVID. Uh, remotely and with physical presence of our team uh, because uh, I think both us and of course our partners, our local partners, the company that we are working with understand that uh, uh, this is time to do it. And we were able to deploy our technology to production with large players in the industry during COVID because of the understanding of both sides. And yes, it's not going to be easy. There are restrictions. There are a lot of challenges that we need to meet, but this is the time to do it. And I'm very happy that we did it uh, and we put the extra effort. We had a great local support uh, and great partners in India and we were able to deploy the technology into production in large scale during COVID. And it's exactly because what you said, the understanding of the, it's, this is the time. We can't wait because this is something that the, these assets are going to, be, uh, going to be, we're going to use them for the next 50 years. So uh, again, COVID, it, it's tough times and we hope for the best that uh, it will get better. Uh, in India and in worldwide, but we want to make sure that we are doing what we can without, of course, uh, uh, taking too much of a risk you know, to make sure that we will have what we need moving forward as well. So we are here and we are happy to support uh, uh, the local efforts and, and, and we are honored actually to do it uh, with, with the great partners that we have in the country. <music>
Okay, so anyway, so first, uh, thanks, thank you for the invitation uh, to us uh, from Economic Times. So if you look at the COVID-19, so I think the, the impact and uh, the disruption happened in last year is at a very large extent to this industry. So uh, in last, I think in April last year, so in China, so the whole logistic thing, logistics things and also the, uh, the supply chain management is still in a disaster. We are not able to produce as much as a, a, a possible to supply the world. And then we will have very low sort of like uh, um, uh, assumption on, the, on this uh, demand side for the world. So, and then in the Q3, even we back up from our, uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19, we get very good contain like management by the, our, our governments. Even we contain the, in a very, bes uh, very good scenario, but we are not able to like to supply the world with uh, the very actually high demand from the world. So we experienced a very tough situation in Q3 and Q4. And this impact actually leading to another uh, very so-called um, disrupt, disruption as well in this Q1 and Q2. But the good to see we are still uh, managed in our company level. So we, in last year, we, especially to Indian, so we have been, a, I think, with consistent leader in this, this market in terms of shipment and the technology. So we captured a market about 22% of with a shipment of reach in one, 1.2 giga. And only in one year in 2020, and lead, we lead this market. And also in addition to this, Jingo has been a recognized top supplier for sure in the, in the Q4 and even in this Q1. Jingo, we boost uh, a, a risk of customer mix between major IPPs and CNI developers and uh, EPC and also rooftop player and even distributors. So we have been, able to penetrate in this in this those all the segment segments. I think I think the module markets are currently finding it's very difficult to to bear the cost pressure pressure from the upstream. So which is transmitted from like a polysilicon and previously is cell and then previously is uh, the, the the glasses and also even the EVA, even other aluminum the sector. So as per the polysilicon, it price continues racing uh, recently since last year, I think last uh, July. So the recent polysilicon price in Q1 announced by the major supplier with 10% higher compared to Q4, especially I think it's December. Now with the recent days, we are experiencing at a 20%. So basically uh, if pertaining to overseas markets, uh, the, the, the uh, the prevention, the control of the pan pandemic has decelerated the speed of logistic for the imported policy as well. So extended the duration of clearance along the unsolved issue regarding to the unmitigated shortage in, short, uh, in shipping containers. So this has resulted in dramatic increase in purchase cost and expected to be on the rise going forward as well. Uh, yeah, so after the Chinese New Year, glass price, okay, is fall a little bit. Um, but uh, if you look at the module size, it's different. If you look at a small module, the glass is quite, I mean, this glass uh, supply is quite abundant. But if you look at what we are advocating is Y82 millimeter with a size for this kind of module, I think the glass shortage will be there for, for the next uh, one to two quarters again. So. Uh, but anyway, as a top sub, uh, supplier for module in, in the in the world, we are in a better position compared to other uh, module makers because we have the full supply chain and we have the full value chain. We manufacture the wafer by ourselves and the cell and the module for sure. BCD is actually a paradigm shift in the uh, Indian solar program. Several global investors as well very conscious choice to invest in Indian and look at the pro progressively uh, the policies. The IPP are always willing to take risk by offer lower tariff and they also meet the renewable energy targets in India. So better after bit. So they could only achieve such a low tariff due to certain positive and supportive. So for the BCD will be kicking kick, kick for sure. Maybe April 1st, I'm not sure, but maybe for extended for, 
for uh, one quarter or even two quarters because of uh, COVID-19. So I think the government should be balanced between the lower tariff of the electricity of solar, solar power plants, or they need to boost it up for this uh, solar manufacturer based in, in India. So we, for China, we are not balanced with by one day. So we have done this for the last 10 years to do the balance. If you look at the demands, I think uh, mm, even after this price surge in the past three quarters, but the demands from US and demands from uh, Europe, Australia, a lot of America and the India uh, remain, remain in a very strong level. So especially in US and Europe, because of the penetration of the rooftop and the CNI project, they have very high PPA price. So they are able to bear the cost of the module cost of surge. And also in India, because we have a lot of legacy projects from 2020, we have to be, uh, this, those projects has to be commit, commissioned in this year. And also before the kicking of the BCB, tons of demands, they want to be allocated during this time frame, so uh, demand side is is quite abundant from my side, and uh, for supply side, so if it will be very very interesting because now if you look at the structure of the supplier of the module, so tier one, they are sitting in the better position in terms of cost structure and in terms of capacity as well as technology advancements, the capability to to renewal of their technology uh, capability. But the tier two, they have less capacity and the short-term value chain in this, in this segment. So they are maybe not able to sustain in this kind of uh, market. So uh, we are keen to see to what going to be happening in 2021 and 2022 going forward. I think within the next three to four years, uh, the market will be sort of like a polarized. So the top tier module supplier, we enjoy uh, the development and the boosting up of the energy sector, the new sector, but the others, uh, they will be a little bit suffering. It's very good to see like Indian renewable energy market now is adopting the new technology. I mean, in terms of the solar, so high efficiency, and technology now, which it allow low maintenance cost at first, and also overall lower LCOE to meet this like high R demands in India. Because anyway, the uh, the capex in India is low, but on the other hand, uh, bank they are asking for higher rates uh, for the for the lending cost. So anyway, among wind and hydro, various new to buy. Um, frames has been adopted as well. So we should also live to the overall improvement to KPEX and the OPEX. So talking about solar, especially, especially almost all the major top tier panel ma manufacturer are now offering monocrop technology and as well as the bifacial technology. So even use the latest 182 millimeter wave technology to this market. Almost over 90% of the IPPs and EPCs they're considering such innovative, innovative technologies, which has pushed the tariff to historical low level, coupled with this, this, this acceptance of tracker technology is also gaining prominence leading to the better year. And also innovations in robotic cleaning system are also held in this case as well. So looking into the next two to three years time, the end type wafer and also top count cell technology will be the two evolutionary uh, factor for pushing down the solar cost as well. For our new technology, first let us, I mean, speak of the wafer. So uh, in 2020, so we were advocating with other top tier manufacturer for the 182 millimeter wafers. We have done a lot of analysis for the power plants. We talked to the IPP, we talked to the EPC, and also the tracker company and the structure company, and all, as well as uh, the inverter company. We found out 182 millimeter wafer is the best choice and 
and so far for the power plant to lower the cost. So uh, to be honest, it's not a, a very innovative and a re 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 revolutionary technology for the cell. The, but this new size, we created very new space for the cost down for the total uh, capex, as well as the, this, uh, uh, the tariff. Uh, we are leading global supplier and I keep on expanding our manufacturing base year over year. So we have, uh, in China, we have several plants and also in Malaysia. And then we are also going to uh, have new facility in, in other Southeast Asia country. And we already have 400 megawatts capacity in US even. So now we are evaluating the recent change in India renewable energy policies and share and solar module uh, import framework. Uh, and, at a very, and at a very appropriate time, so we will take a call on this for this manu local manufacturing points. But we are drafting the proposal uh, to our boards and they're asking for the clarification also from the MNIE. Uh, I think basically a Chinese module fac factor or, uh, sorry, the Chinese module manufacturer makers, we need a very stable policy and uh, better support from infrastructure. And also the balance between the state governments and also from the uh, central government. So because investing a uh, manufacturing base is not for five years. So we are talking about 10 years operation in this country and even 20 years operation in this, in this country. So we need to think more thoroughly and comprehensively. <music>
So conventionally, most of the producing points were connected through trunk pipelines, and uh, then the city gas distribution centers, all the consumption points were linked to the pipeline. And uh, obviously, we do realize that laying trunk pipelines across India is a time-consuming job, and government has quickly realized to get to the accelerated targets which government is looking at. The way it can move forward is to ramp up the upstream infrastructure when I say upstream infrastructure, in addition to the local production of oil and gas, they have started focusing on import of natural gas through LNG terminals. So significant impetus was given to development of LNG terminals, which a couple of them are almost on the verge of commissioning. A couple of them are already commissioned. And more and more uh, terminals, including uh, AGNP's own uh, plant terminal in Karaikal, also is going to be commissioned. This will add significantly to the kitty of making more and more natural gas available in the in the country. Significant technology trends are emerging where rather than moving entire molecule through trunk pipelines, we have now moved significantly forward in terms of LNG logistics where truck -based, LNG truck-based uh, molecule transport has become order of the day. Like uh, we, we ourselves as AGNP were leaders in LNG technologies across the world. We are implementing our LNG terminal. Along with LNG terminal, uh, we have also won 31 districts uh, for city gas distribution development. These 31 districts are spread across uh, five states of India, which is Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Karnataka. All these areas are almost combined areas of this is 2,85,000 square kilometers area, which constitutes 8% of India's land mass. See, every energy transition is a huge opportunity for uh, the entire uh, society because ultimately society will benefit uh, the investors, investor, investor community, and obviously the governments. Everyone, every stakeholder in the entire, uh, during the energy transition wins. What we need to do is this energy transition needs to be done in a sustainable way without uh, impacting the environment in a, uh, any adverse way. And luckily, uh, what in the energy space, what we're talking about natural gas is one of the most environmentally friendly and uh, safe fuels. So whatever project at accelerated pace you bring in in this energy transition is going to aid uh, significantly to all the stakeholders involved. In fact, government of India, because of some public health concerns, has started putting huge focus on replacing all the fuels with natural gas. And as a result of that, the CGD bidding also is getting accelerated. This sector and obviously any sector, so when we look at specifically city gas sector, I had mentioned that entire uh, AGNP's business plans are based on LNG terminals, based on uh, LNG store, transporting through LNG trucks, uh, storing at hundreds of uh, locations across uh, these states, uh, LNG small LNG storages, and then moving it through various means to the customers, okay? In the entire business process, okay, the technology plays a significant role because from LNG terminal to LNG individual storages, okay, all these storages are connected uh, uh, through technology to a central server where the levels in each of the tanks would be need to be 24 by 7 monitored at a control room, which we'll be doing, okay? Why this is relevant is with this technology, we would be able to, this is part one. Part two is all the LNG trucks would be tracked on road on their uh, safety moment, as well as at what pace they're moving and where exactly they are there. Th this is second point. So from the terminal, our control rooms would be located at each of the terminal, outside the terminal, okay? And from there, based on the real-time data where the storage uh, is getting depleted fast because there is a downstream consumption, we would be able to divert our trucks on a real-time basis to that specific location so that we'll be able to optimize our capital expenditure as well as running out of uh, liquid at a specific location. So we'd be able to divert trucks uh, on a real-time basis based on that. That is uh, in terms of the upstream up to the storage point. On downstream of that, all the connectors, industrial customers are uh, actually connected through GPS uh, to our control room where 
their consumption is stacked 24 by 7 now in terms of safety most of these lng lng plants which we are going to have are going to be connected to uh, local control rooms where uh, the remote operations would be able to do in case of uh, some gas leakage or something so that will improve your safety and security of the installation and uh, surrounding public also would be uh, positively benefited with that so the technology in uh, improving the safety security as well as the storage and capital capex optimization as well as the cost savings primarily because huge travel movement to lakhs and lakhs of customers homes every once in a month everything is avoided once you go through the digitization so there is a huge focus in uh, this sector for uh, digitization and automation which will improve uh, the business cycle efficiency significantly yeah when i look at leadership i look at leadership across the entire value chain where each and every stakeholder has a role to play and a leadership role to play it is just not only support role it's a leadership role i'll i'll actually clarify why i am saying everyone in the value chain has a role to play is like in this hydrocarbon sector the central government india has a huge leadership role to play in looking at uh, macro economics of the sector and uh, where exactly natural gas uh, needs to be made available how do you create infrastructure upstream of the sector whether it is opening up of uh, more rounds for exploration in india or making more lng terminals uh, approval so that more more people can come in and uh, bring in more terminals making more gas available this is where central government can play uh, in terms of the planning as well as a structured regulatory mechanism to ensure that the sector is properly managed regulated uh, with uh, absolutely non discriminatory opportunities to both the private and the public enterprises not only indian players as well as multinational players so that you need to create the comfort as well as confidence to the investors that the long term as a long term player they have future in india in making uh, their businesses in india and they will be allowed to have consistency of policies is one confidence booster for uh, now when it comes to the individual investors when the investors come in whatever is being committed as the project uh, pace at which it needs to be implemented there is a serious leadership demonstration which uh, all the companies need to do in india to show that they mean business they mean what they commit and they need to actually roll the projects at the pace at which they are committing and that is only possible through committed leadership uh, at the outset i must congratulate et energy world and all your partners for organizing this particular event of great importance in the present context where we are running out of time to control the climate change so first of all let us note that we have a large scale energy transition and disruption already happening uh, globally throughout the world uh, especially uh, you know those who are really uh, aware and uh, you know concerned etc if i talk of solar solar is moving from gigawatts to terawatts today we are already at uh, 734 gigawatts and uh, uh, we expect and this uh, pandemic year we have added 107 gigawatts so uh, we expect all this pace to go up and uh, the uh, terawatts and maybe uh, more of solar will always be there and solar has been reckoned as the most important source uh, in all the future development which also we will touch and let us not underestimate wind energy as well in wind has also uh, uh, the, today uh, the capacity of uh, 743 gigawatts so they are also doing well uh, uh, we should equally support uh, and in this disruption number 1 the prices have come down how can, can we ever imagine 2 cents 
just uh, think five years ago, just think 10 years ago, two cents, uh, the energy is available. And uh, it is going to be less even uh, as we go further. Then storage in a big way is going to play important role globally. And storage costs have also come down, though they need to come out much more. Uh, similarly, green hydrogen, hydrogen storage, uh, hydrogen batteries, so to say, and most importantly, the electric vehicles. Uh, 175 gigawatts was set as RE target. Then we talked of in between 250 gigawatts, and today we are talking of 450 gigawatts. India is today known for talking about 450 gigawatts. So those are the factors contributing to investment. There are some more factors. As an investment destination, India is considered good. You know why I move around the world? And, uh, because there are well-established institutions. And also, equally important, there are successful Indian entrepreneurs, you know, uh, who are our members. For instance, Renew, ECMI, Tata, Adani, uh, the, you know, they're all uh, examples for the world to see that, yes, in India, you can grow. And we also had a direct foreign also like uh, Fortum, SoftBank, hmm, uh, et cetera. So awareness of what is happening around the world is a very important step uh, leading to good leadership uh, action in uh, his own place. You see, energy system has to be totally overall. We cannot have the present uh, inefficient grid. Uh, we cannot have uh, the present, uh, you know, uh, uh, emissions apart from inefficiency. So the next uh, disruption is going to be decentralized energy. And also I say that we'll have technology playing a very important role apart from everything else. Uh, storage technologies, for instance, digital is going to play a very important role beyond any doubt. Energy storage also, uh, uh, the digital part is going to play an important role because you know all parameters have to be properly monitored and measured. I must say that political leadership is the important uh, part. Then the rest of the people will follow, they will be encouraged. Investment follows policy. So if your policy is all right, people will come. But then implementation is equally important. 